And what we're going to go over tonight is just some fire safety tips, um, hopefully some information that's, that you haven't had before, hopefully some stuff that's going to um, maybe mitigate the potential for a fire later um, in your homes and things like that. So um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, Jamie, I have a question. Though. Yes, ma'am. Can you uh, give me something over your background? I mean, oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I actually went to school to be a firefighter. Um, I did that for a while, uh, tried to get on Madison. It's a long, long, long journey. Um, so I was doing a lot of volunteer work in different places and then uh, I blew out my knee. So I decided I should probably take a different career path and then I worked for Stryker Medical for about 12 years, uh, which does a lot of EMS stuff. Um, uh, I fixed hospital beds, but I worked with a lot of the EMS places around here and stuff. Um, and I do have kid, two kids, like I told you, a nine-year-old uh, and an 11-year-old who actually live and go to school here in Oregon, uh, which is why I decided to do this in Oregon first, because this community is kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, uh, obviously my kids are on a lot of sports teams like we talked about, and so I know a lot of people, um, and I also know the likelihood and the possibility of people having fires, and if I can help anybody mitigate that, I would like to do that. So, um, so now the company that I work for, for is called Fire Safety Technologies. Um, it's a uh, company located in Madison. There's uh, the owner of our company has two branches, one in Dubuque and one in Madison. Um, and the corporate office is down in Texas. Um, so we have a bunch of different products actually, um, the company that I work for. Uh, but ideally what I was hoping to do tonight is not really talk about any of that, really just get you guys some important fire safety tips and some information. So. Um, the company that I work for, Fire Safety Technologies, uh, we do support some really good causes. Um, the Fallen Heroes Scholarship Fund, which is um, fallen firefighters. Um, the Shriners Hospital for Children, which is obviously for families um, who can't afford necessarily the health care that their children need. And then the Phoenix Society for Burns Survivors, which is for obviously burn survivors and their families. So. Um, we do uh, safety meetings. Should anybody want one at work or anything like that, you can go ahead and reach out. Um, all of the information that I'm going to share with you comes from the experts. Um, it comes from people, obviously, who really know what they're talking about. The reason that that matters is we didn't just go out in the back and test this to see if it was going to work out, right? We've gotten, uh, our company has gathered this information from a number of different places. Um, Obviously, insurance companies get a great idea of who's having fires, what kind of fires they're having, and how catastrophic they are. Um, National Fire Prevention Association, obviously the news, the International Code Council. Um, so there's a ton of information about fires. Very few people actually take the time to learn about them or to understand them. Um, one of the biggest misconceptions about fire is that it won't happen to me. but Obviously, you know that it can happen. We talked about that earlier. Um, fortunately, you were able to be there and prevent that um, early on. There are a lot of things that we can do to mitigate or decrease the likelihood of us having a fire. Um, there's also a lot of stuff that we can't do, but it's at least good to have the information um, so that we can move um, towards protecting ourselves. So. Eight out of 10 fire deaths occur at home. Nighttime fires are the most deadly. Fire departments respond to fires every 24 seconds. This is based on in the United States. Um, home fires kill an average of seven people each day and almost 50 people are injured every day by fire. So, um, I don't know, what did you guys, did you think that it was more than that, less than that? Had you ever really thought about it at all? Seven people a day seems like a lot to me when I think about it. Um, but then when I think about the people who I know have had fires or anything like that, it kind of makes sense, you know? So, um, the question is, could you have a fire? And you can. The big thing is, Nighttime fires are the most dangerous, and the reason they're most dangerous is because we're least prepared for them. Home fire, or er, eight out of 10 deaths happen at home because when we're at home, the majority of time that we're at home, we're asleep, right? Otherwise, we're away from the house, we're at work. 
we get home, we're awake for about three or four hours, and then we're sleeping probably seven or eight hours. Um, during that time, we are, A, we don't really have a sense of smell. Our smell kind of turns off when we're sleeping. Uh, two out of three children actually don't hear the sound of fire alarms, smoke alarms going off. Um, so these are a couple factors that factor into that, as well as how fire impacts us and things like that. We're going to go over that here shortly. But the way that it develops, and uh, fire is a living thing. It's a, it's a thing that takes oxygen. It needs to breathe, right? It does crazy things. It's unpredictable. Um, and so we need to think in a way that's going to protect us on a multitude of levels, right? First thing is the warranty cards for the things in your kitchen. Do you guys fill them out? Warranty cards for the stuff that you buy. Dishwashers, uh, whether it's big stuff, little stuff, so coffee pots, dishwashers, stoves, ovens, any of those things, do you guys fill out the warranty cards that come with them? Sometimes. And send it back? Sometimes. Okay. I am terrible at that, I'm gonna be honest. I never used to do it. Um, the reason that we do it is because if you don't send them back and there's a recall, we did, they don't send you the information that there's a recall. So you won't know that there's a recall on a product that you have sitting in your kitchen or in your home if you don't send those things in, okay? The reason that that matters is, for instance, coffee pots, which let's see if we could do that. See the Keurig up there? Right now, 6.2 million Keurigs have been recalled. I have a Keurig sitting on my counter. I have no idea if it's been recalled or not. The reason I didn't fill it out is because we live in a disposable world. I figured if the Keurig broke, throw it out and buy a new Keurig, right? I didn't think about what would happen if the Keurig started on fire. So there's a number of things. Whoops. Um, let's try that. Don't let me do it. So even our dishwashers. People think, well, it's got water in it. What can start on fire in a dishwasher? A, it's pulling electricity a significant amount, and it has a heating element in it, right? These things can all cause fires. So, the next thing is your garage. Does anybody here have a smoke detector in the garage? Okay. What about you got a smoke detectors in your garage? Nope. Not supposed to have a smoke detector in your garage because of the way that smoke detectors work. But what is in our garage? Our cars, which have gasoline, right? Paints, maybe our propane tank from our grill if it's the middle of winter, right? Very, very, very flammable things, even rags in a bag. So it's a place where we see a ton of fires, but we don't actually have a way to protect ourselves from that because we're not supposed to put smoke detectors out there. So it's about learning how to properly dispose of rags, properly dispose of chemicals, okay? And your community, depending on what community it is, they will actually, they likely have information on that. Don't let that stuff sit in your garage because we always think, oh, well, I'll get to it later, I'll get to it later. Well, later, you know, might be too late. Um, garages are oftentimes under bedrooms or attached to a house. If it's under a bedroom and the fire starts in the garage, how are you gonna know about that fire? You won't know about it until it burns up, right? And then you're already at a significant risk. So it's really important to do something to um, mitigate the fire risk in there. Like I said, the key is to be aware of what's potentially flammable and unfortunately, some of the things you can't mitigate, I, I was just talking with you and I know that there was a fire about a month ago in Stoughton um, in the garage where the car caught on fire. And then the car caught the garage on fire and then the garage caught the house on fire. Um, but anything that we can mitigate, we should. The thing about garage fires and attic fires is that because they're below us and above us, oftentimes in our living spaces or off to the side, we don't know about them until somebody drives by and tells us that our attic is on fire, that our basement's on fire. 65% um, of all fires start in five places in our home. Our basement, 
our attic, our kitchen, our garage, and our utility room. So next, what do you think is the leading cause of fire in laundry rooms? Very, very, very flammable. Um, there was just a house in Mad uh, Sun Prairie where two police officers were injured because the dryer started on fire. So how often do you clean out your lint? Thanks. Every time you use it. Every time you use it. What about you guys, every time you use it? Okay, mm -hmm. how often do you clean the lint thing outside? Twice a year. Maybe. Twice a year, okay. What about the hose between the dryer and the outside of the house? Same. Every, twice a year? Twice a year. You're winning this battle right now, I'm going to tell you. How often do you guys do it? Occasionally. Okay. <laughs> I let my husband do it. I feel like you're making that up. I feel like... <laughs> it has been done before, we'll okay. say. Okay. It's really important to do that, and I'm going to show you why here in a second. Um, right there on the video, I'm convinced that that's all the lost socks in the world <laughs> that are coming out of there right now. But that is a significant amount of debris that comes out of there. So two things happen. Obviously, A, that stuff is tremendously flammable on its own, right? But B, it also can clog that entire thing, which then makes everything before it and after it heat up, right? The next thing about this is there's different kind of dryer venting, okay? There's the solid metal that's actually a formed metal. Is that what you guys have? She's nodding. Mm -hmm. um, there's also kind of a, a whiter plastic one, and then there's a metal one that's almost like an accordion, really soft. It reminds me of a slinky only filled in, okay? That is actually not dryer venting. That is not heat rated. And they put it on the shelves at Menards and places like that. That's actually for fans. So for like ceiling fans and things like that that don't, don't put out heat. It's less expensive. And so people put it on their dryers, and then that will actually create a fire. So make sure that when you are replacing your stuff, if you're not cleaning it, if you replace it or anything, that you're actually getting what is the right stuff for your dryer. Because that could be the difference between, you know, just losing a sock here and there and potentially losing a whole bunch more than that. So bedroom fires. Bedroom fires are becoming more and more and more and more common. Any guesses why? Smartphones. Just more electronics. More stuff we have in our bedroom, right? 30 years ago, we didn't have our phones plugged in next to our head or our iPads or our laptops. We probably didn't have TVs in our bedroom, right? We probably didn't have power strips to plug in all the stuff we now have in our bedroom, right? And so there are more and more bedroom fires that are happening. The problem is, is that if they're a smoldering fire, if it's a, if it's a fast burning fire, we're probably going to see it, right? You think? But if it's a smoldering fire, fire works the same way either way. Fire needs oxygen. So if it's a smoldering fire and you're sleeping in there, it's still going to be sucking the oxygen away from you. So it's really, really, really important to avoid things that could potentially start a fire. So. For instance, there we've got the phone charger. Phone should only be charging for two hours, okay? Have you ever grabbed the base of your charger and it's been warm? Yeah, that's not, that's not good. So what we wanna do is charge your phone for two hours, then unplug it, not just your phone, the entire charger, okay? A charger left in, plugged in a wall, whether it's charging a phone or not, is as dangerous as a lit candle sitting there. It's just a matter of time. So make sure you unplug that. Just set it off to the side. You don't have to do anything else, but just unplug it. Um, also, same thing with things on your counter. If you can unplug your cure, unplug it. If you can unplug your toaster, unplug it. There's things you can't unplug. You can't unplug your, you know, your uh, refrigerator. You can't unplug your stove. But the things that you can mitigate, you know, the potential do that. I know it's kind of a pain. I don't know about you guys. I don't use my toaster every day. I just, I don't. The Keurig gets used every day, but not by me. Um, you know, the toaster oven, all those things. I don't use them every day, but yet they sit there. And if you think about your house, even if you unplug everything inside your house, your house is still plugged in, right? There's still power coming to those outlets. So 
again, there are certain things that we can protect against, i.e., we can unplug things, but we can't unplug our house. So if you, another thing is, um, like rodents, if you start to see that you've got mice, raccoons upstairs, any of that stuff, you, like tend to that. Um, because they will go in and chew on wires, or one will actually use like a certain area as a restroom and then a different animal will actually come and chew in that area. Um, it's how a lot of fires and things like that start up in attics. So if you see a hole in your soffit, make sure that you're plugging it. I know people think, oh, I want the squirrels to have a nice, happy, happy winter, happy, safe in my attic winter. You really don't want that. The squirrels will be fine living out in a tree. So, uh, there you go. Lightning strikes. Ceiling fans, bathroom fans, wall sockets, all the wires in your walls, ceiling, and subfloor. These are all things that we can't protect against or mitigate, right? We can't, I can't do anything about the wires in my wall. You know, I can make sure that I'm putting plugs and things. I can make sure that I'm not overloading circuits. I can make sure that I'm, you know, making sure that my fuse box is not getting wet from some sort of weird leakage or anything like that. I mean, there are things that we can do, um, but there's a lot of things that we can't do, which is why we need to put other things in place to kind of help with that. There you go. We already covered that. So, here is a video. Hold on here. This is a video. Um, like I said, I went to the fire academy. I've had a lot of people tell me they knew about a 9 volt battery and um, steel wool as something to take with them to start a fire or camping or something. You're nodding? Okay. What I didn't know, and actually what I just saw a couple weeks ago, they had one of these in Madison, um, is, is how else a 9 volt battery can work. But did you know what's in there could actually start a fire? Tonight, Five on Your Side consumer advocate Jonathan Walsh has the bottom line on the potential dangers of 9 volt batteries and what you need to know before the flames start. By themselves, stuff in your junk drawer or maybe a random box, pretty harmless. But you get the right combination can create something like this. I had a fire hack. I couldn't believe it. I didn't fire something inside your house? It's real. Uh, batteries are dangerous. David Miller's home in Fort Collins, Colorado caught fire after, of all things, he changed the 9 volt batteries out of his smoke detectors and put the old ones in a paper bag to be recycled. The morning of the fire, I had moved the bag around, and that's apparently what caused the batteries to in the right position to short against each other. David's house is not alone. We uncovered this 9-volt battery hazard alert from the New Hampshire State Fire Marshal after flames broke out in a kitchen junk drawer in that state. We investigated these kinds of fires with the Broadview Heights Fire Department and the Northeastern Ohio Fire Prevention Association. I was there as Assistant Chief Joe Fleming showed how a coin can go from 74 degrees to more than 150 within minutes of touching the terminals on a 9-volt battery. The thinner the metal, um, the more tendency it's going to have to heat up even, even to a higher temperature. We then put together our own junk drawer with keys, coffee filters, steel wool for washing pots and pans and more. On our third try of closing the drawer with a 9 volt battery inside, notice how the battery slides and makes contact with the steel wool. Now, normally there would be a counter on top of this drawer in a typical kitchen, so the open air on this demonstration and breezes have an effect on how quickly the fire starts. But just like those fires in Colorado and New Hampshire, the flames get going. You go to bed and that thing could be smoldering for hours before it really bursts into flames. So here's what this all means to you. You can help prevent these kinds of fires by placing the caps back on your 9-volt batteries. You can get some electrical tape and place it right over the terminals of your batteries. Or simply take your battery, place it right back into the original packaging for storage. I'm Five Your Side Consumer Advocate, Jonathan Walsh. Firefighters tell us the 9-volt batteries are the focus of concern because of the placement of the terminals side by side and a more common use in typical columns.
Okay, so you knew about the steel wool. Did you know about the rest of that? I was the potential for fire. Oh, <laughs> very nice. <laughs> and you knew about the potential for the rest of the fire too. Then, obviously. Um, what about you guys? I have no? no idea. Okay. Um, the best thing to do um, is to just put them right back in the package. And if you're disposing of nine volt batteries, even if you're disposing of them, put something over the top of them because just because they're not necessarily making a toy work or something like that doesn't mean that they are completely dead and have no power. Um, it's also not just nine volts. I had a gentleman tell me that he was wearing his work pouch, took one of his cordless drill batteries, tossed it in his pouch, put the new one in, and it actually started his pouch on fire because he had nails in there. And so it had made the connection that way. So it's actually just a positive to a negative. It's just a lot easier to do on a nine volt because of where they're located. Um, so it is just really important. I mean, it could happen with any type of battery. So I would suggest no matter what you're disposing to always just cover at least the positive terminal on it. Um, and I don't know about here in, in Oregon whether you guys have a specific battery disposal place or not. Okay. Well, yeah, then just make sure because it literally could be tin foil in your garbage can and you throw a nine volt in there. It doesn't have to necessarily be a drawer. Um, could be any number of things. So, do you, um, for you guys, what we've covered so far, um, is there a room in your home that you're the most concerned about as far as having a fire? Is there a room that you think, no, not particularly? No, no. I just came because I had a question about placement of the smoke detectors. Okay, and I can help you with that as well. Hopefully I'm going to give you a lot of good information before then. <laughs> I'm glad you stayed. Uh, what about you guys? All of them. All of them? My oh, husband's a techie, so we have a lot of electronics all over. Right. All over. Right. I totally get that. Um, and all of that stuff's drawing power. Yeah. And you probably have 100 or 200 amp service, depending on where you live, uh, oh. and you're pulling a ton of stuff. Oh, yeah. We, I, yeah. we have the uh, TDS. Yeah. It's well, and the important thing, too, um, to remember is if you are using a, an extension cord or a um, strip, a power strip or anything like that, just because it has outlets doesn't actually matter or mean that it has power. If you plug it into the wall and, you know, you've got 110 coming out of the wall, it's not like it multiplies the amount of electricity that's coming out. You still have the same amount. The idea is that you're just pulling in thing or plugging in things that are going to have a smaller amp draw. So if you're pulling out some pelly, I'm sorry, if you're plugging in something that has a large amp draw, you're actually putting yourself at risk because that's not what the power strips are for. You want to pull, plug those directly into um, the wall. You also want to make sure that things are grounded. If you ever have a broken ground plug on something, get a new plug on that. Ground plugs are they're there for a reason. I know they bust off or we go. They, they actually are there for a reason. Grounding things is actually incredibly important. So, um, homes these days burn eight times faster than they did in the past. Uh, any ideas why? Flammable insulation. Flammable everything. That's an excellent. That's an excellent answer. Um, about you know, 40, 50 years ago, homes were made with solid wood and furniture was made with solid wood and it was made to last and things were made to stay, right? We now live in what I like to call the disposable society, which is why I didn't turn in my curing warranty because if it breaks, I'm not gonna have it fixed, I'm just gonna throw it out, I'm gonna get a new one, right? Same thing with our couches, same things with, you know, our, our carpet or anything, we just get rid of stuff now. And because we get rid of stuff, it's made cheaper. And the cheaper it's made, the more, the more flammable it is, oddly enough. Um, synthetics burn incredibly quickly. Uh, they seep uh, um, a toxic gas. It's called off-gassing, and when things get hot, they actually release this gas that turns into fuel for a fire, okay? Um, a lot of the stuff that we have made now, um, IKEA stuff burns quickly, shocking, right? Our homes, the wood that we use, everything's put together with Blue. Blue is an accelerant. So basically what we've done is we've now made our houses into kindling. 
So what used to take 30, 40, 50 minutes, I had a woman, Sylvia, a lovely woman, we spent two hours going over her batteries after we watched that, because she had two big battery boxes, we had to cover every one of them up, she's very sweet. Um, she told me she had a house fire. And I said, well, what, can you tell me about that? She said, yeah, you know, my attic, I could hear this crackling, and I realized my attic was on fire, and so I went to my kitchen, and I got my purse, and I got my car keys, and I backed my car out of the garage, and she's telling me all these things that she did, and I'm just awestruck. And I said, Sylvia, when did this happen? She goes, oh, like 40 years ago. I said, I need you to promise me that if that happens, if you ever have another, just, just please just get out. Like, you know, it's, you don't have the time that we used to have. Things just burn far too quickly and far too hot. So the, uh, the moral of that story is how it used to be is not how it is anymore. And if you get the chance to get out of fire, get out of the fire and don't go back in. There's nothing inside that building that is more important than your safety outside of that building. So here's a little video. Um, this was crazy to me. So the room on the right hand side is the synthetic room. This is the natural room. Basically one is the newer stuff. The one on the left is the older stuff. You can see that they start fires in the same spot at the same time. Two things. Look at how fast that flame is growing and look at the smoke, what we believe to be smoke above it, okay? By about this point, that room is close to 600 degrees already. At three minutes and 22 seconds, what you're gonna see is that smoke flash over. And the reason that is, is because that wasn't smoke. That was all of those toxic gases being let off, okay? So that's actually called off-gassing, it was fuel. So you had a room go from no fire to completely engulfed in fire in three minutes and 22 seconds. And the truth of the matter is after about two minutes, the likelihood of you making out of that room is significantly decreased due to the temperature and obviously the toxic gas levels and things like that. You don't have time to mess around with it. You need to get out. Um, also, Um, actually, we'll get to that in just a second. So, there are five killers in a fire. Flames, asphyxiation, superheated air, smoke, and toxic gases. What do you think is most likely to kill you in a fire? Asphyxiation. Smoke? What do you think? I've always heard it was smoke. What do you think it is? Asphyxiation. She wins in the back. Asphyxiation. The reason for that is, is because fire needs oxygen. Remember I talked about it being a living thing? It's a living thing. And the fact that it needs oxygen to live. If it doesn't have oxygen, it actually dies, okay? But the second it gets oxygen again, it can actually refuel itself. Unlike us, if we don't have oxygen for a long time, we're just done. Fire's not the same. Fire can go without oxygen, and it actually almost becomes dormant for a while. Um, the way that that works is a fire sucks oxygen from everywhere in your home, okay? Fire uses 16% of the oxygen in the air. We need 21% oxygen to live. There's 21% oxygen in the air, okay? And then it obviously breaks down into hydrogen and other things. 21% oxygen in the air, we need 21%, and a fire takes 16%. That leaves 5% for us. That's not much, right? Not gonna do us any good. And fires pull it from everywhere, kind of like we do. If we, if we are walking around, we're, we're sucking in the air from everywhere we go, right? Fire can actually do it from being stationary. A fire can suck the air from that room, and that room, and that room, all while being stationary, which is what makes it incredibly dangerous. You can have a fire in the living room, never know that you had a fire, and yet it's still sucking oxygen from your bedroom, right? It's still sucking oxygen from your kitchen, from all of these other places. 
And if we don't know that it's going on and it's sucking all of our oxygen, we become oxygen deprived. And what happens when we become oxygen deprived? Sleepy. We get less and less cognitively able, right? So this is kind of a diagram of what that looks like. So up there, normal atmosphere, 21%, we're in green, we're good to go, right? As the fire is sucking the oxygen, you can see it coming from everybody's room, from the hallways, that quickly we're down to between 15 and 19 is decreased stamina. 12 to 14 is an impaired condition, or impaired coordination, sorry, also a condition. Uh, 10 to 12, poor judgment. 8 to 10 is mental failure. And 4 to 6 is death. So very, very, very rapidly we go from being completely able to being some degree impaired, okay? The reason a lot of people die in fires is because A, if they're asleep, they just don't wake up, right? They'll find them in bed where they were sleeping. The upside is, is if you didn't know it, you know, at least you didn't know you had fire, right? The downside is, is that you didn't have the opportunity to do anything. Like you didn't know, you didn't know that anything was happening. There's a couple ways to, again, we can't prevent a fire, but we can mitigate how it impacts you. So first things, sleep with your bedroom doors closed. Do you do that? Mm -hmm. Do you do that? You do that? You do that? Yes. Bedroom doors closed. The reason for that is, is that it's still going to suck oxygen, but it's only going to suck it from the top and the bottom cracks, which is going to give you significantly longer, right? The other thing is, if you believe there's a fire, check the door. If the door is warm, don't go that way. Okay? That's common sense. The other thing is, don't even open that door to check, because guess what happens when you open that door? You've now fed the fire, haven't you? And you've pulled it towards you and made it more difficult. Also, if, you're, if the fires say right here, okay, well, we don't want Elliot to go out this way. Elliot's going to go out her bedroom window, okay? Elliot needs to close her bedroom door before she opens her bedroom window. Because if she opens the bedroom window, what has she done? She's fed the fire, right? So the thing about fire and protecting yourself from fire is partly just understanding how it works. Um, you can keep yourself safer and more out of harm's way if you just understand. Um, my cousin, actually, my aunt had a fire. Her TV exploded, caught the Christmas tree on fire, which then caught all the Christmas presents on fire, right? Because it's kindling. Like, it's just, you know. And so my cousin Michelle comes down. Michelle sees the fire immediately freaks out because that's what we do when we see fire. Front door is that way, okay? Behind her is a side door and a back door that are completely unobstructed. Which door do you think she went out? Front door. Front door. Front door. Because we don't think, right? Because we need to practice and we don't do that because we don't think it's gonna happen to us. And if you just give yourselves one second or two seconds to think about something before you do something, you're gonna keep yourself a lot safer. But that's something you need to train yourself to do. And yes, you're absolutely right. Right through the fire, right through the front door. Her sister Vicky was on the second floor. Also could have come down the stairs, gone out the back door or the side door. She chose to jump off the balcony. She was fine, no injuries, but still. It's just one of those things. So everyone thinks, oh, if I have a fire, I'm gonna be able to do this. I'm going to be able to do this. You're probably not. You're probably going to have to rethink your brain and you're going to have to actually consciously think these things because your body is naturally going to want to do everything to just get you away. So I'm going to ask you guys some questions. Do you have a meeting spot outside your home? No. Used to. <laughs> we still need, we're still going to get you a meeting spot. What about you? Meeting spot outside your home? Perfect. Uh, have you ever done a fire drill in the dark? Yes. No. Yes? Nice. She is so crushing, you guys. <laughs> like, seriously. I don't even want to. No? 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 Yes? 
Pyro? No. All right. Do you replace your smoke alarm batteries in the spring and fall or only when they chirp? Only when they chirp. Chirp once a year. Spring and fall. Okay. She's still whooping you. Even, even with the only once a year, she's still yeah. crushing you guys. <laughs> Do you have fire detection in your attic, garage, kitchen, and laundry room? I don't know if we have in the attic. So I, I guess I'll say no. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good news. I don't have a smoke alarm in the garage. Okay. I do have one in the kitchen. Okay. And I have one in the laundry room. Okay. And you have a smoke detector in the kitchen. Pardon? You do have a smoke detector in the kitchen? Yes. Does it go off when you cook? Yes. <laughs> Sometimes. Okay. That's how we check. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, realistically, because I know what everybody wants to do when I ask this question, but let's be realistic. If you had a fire at 3 a.m., you were. Woken fire, how quickly could you get yourself and whoever else needed to get out of the house, whether it be pets, whether it be, you know, family members, whether it be, you know, the neighbor, I don't know, who hangs out at your house. <laughs> how fast could you get everybody out of your house? That Here's your choices. Two to five minutes. Mm. Now remember, it's dark, it's smoky, it's hot and you're scared, how quickly can you get out of the house? Does it include the time that it takes you to wake up and actually realize that there's a fire? <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's an excellent question. From the time you realize there is a fire. Okay. So the fire could have been burning 15 minutes and maybe you're you know on a steel door on the other side that's sealed and you know, somehow or other, you haven't been asphyxiated yet. <laughs> I don't know. Mm -hmm. How quickly? I'd probably say six to eight. I have no idea. I would think it would be less than that because you just have to go, oh, but I had to don't know. Okay. So, what about you? Uh, when my boys were home, it was under five minutes. Nice. But we had set so that we didn't go looking for one another. Right. They had their own ways of getting out and then we had a meeting spot. Okay, going forward, I'm going to have you just come and teach this class with me because you're awesome. <laughs> okay. What about you? I live on the second floor and I know how to jump out my window. Um, mom, dad, and the pets are supposed to meet up at the meeting spot. So we would are your mom and dad on the same floor yes. as you? They're on the same floor as you? Yes. Okay. Pets are downstairs. Okay. Um, so I could probably get out of the house in under two minutes. Uh huh. However, we've agreed that the pets have their instincts to deal to know what to do with the fire, so they're gonna take care of themselves. We can do a head count afterwards. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. So we all agree that it is not nearly as easy to get out of our house when there is a fire at 3 a.m. and it's hot and smoky and we potentially could be slightly compromised due to e, A, either lack of oxygen, or B, we're just tired. Like when I wake up, it takes me a minute to get everything all shored up. So, my job is to make sure that you guys leave here safer than when you came, okay? So there's a couple ways that I'm gonna do that. Hopefully, it's been happening through the information that I've been giving you. Um, hopefully, it'll, you know, you guys will get a chance to, um, kind of reflect on some of this and go, yeah, I'm going to unplug my phone and I'm going to do this, that, and the other thing. Um, there's also a home safety checklist. We're not going to go over this right now, but I'm going to tell you if there is anything on here that you can um, change from no to yes, we, we, uh, we encourage that. The best fire to have is the one that never happened. <laughs> right? I do have an observation. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this last summer I was staying in an apartment building uh -huh. and we were on the third floor and um, I wear hearing aids. Okay. When the smoke alarm went off, I it was it became part of my dream. Right. So I didn't really realize what it was. That is not uncommon. Um, I actually do the same thing with like my phone alarm and things like that. The decibel level of these alarms, 
um, right here. They're called ionization alarms. They're pretty much what everybody has. Um, like I said, for two out of three children don't hear them. Oftentimes adults don't hear them. Um, and so you live in a condo or an apartment? No, I have a, I have my house here, but I was staying with, in an apartment. Okay, okay, um, okay. For several months. Okay. Yeah, it's it has to do with the decibel level um, and how it permeates your brain, kind of like uh, kind of like the smoke or the uh, smelling or not smelling. Our brains do crazy things when we sleep. Um, so, unfortunately, and those are the ones that they just put up in there. You know, there you can get different ones if you were staying in a place like that. Um, I'm hoping that the fire wasn't well, bad. Well, I was, I was <laughs> staying with my son, and he has good hearing, so he can. <laughs> That's you always hear that smoke alarm. Get up. <laughs> That's always helpful, isn't it? Yes. It's always helpful. Dogs, sons, whatever comes, whatever yes. comes to the rescue. So, um, next, I'm going to give you guys some people locators. So, how many occupied bedrooms do you have in your home? One. Okay. One. One for you. And then how many occupied? Two? Okay. Perfect. So these are people locators. What people locators do, um, you put them on the lower left hand corner of your bedroom window, okay, the occupied bedroom window. The reason for that is, is police always get to a scene before firefighters. The reason for that is they're already in their car, right? As soon as they hear the dispatch, they're heading out. Firefighters, even if they're at the station, still have to get their stuff on, still have to get in the truck, and still have to get to wherever they're going. When the firemen, or when the police get to your house, what they're gonna do is they're gonna be shining their flashlight. They're gonna shine their flashlight and they're gonna see this. And they're gonna know that that's likely, if they don't see you outside the house, likely where you are, right? So that's gonna be the first place that they go to look for you if they don't see you outside. This is the difference between them potentially finding you and not finding you um, in time to get you out safely and uninjured. So, <clears throat> now, there's something called inside there. You open that up, you're going to see something in here called your escape plan. We, before we leave this room, are all going to decide, I have a pen, you guys, whoever doesn't have a pen can use my pen. We're gonna write in there where your meeting spot is. The reason that that is important is because if you get out of the house and your husband gets out of the house and you say our meeting spot is Kevin across the street, it's his yard. At three in the morning with fire trucks and people going everywhere and trying to figure out your husband's on the one side of Kevin's yard and you're on the other side of Kevin's yard, are you going to know he's there? No. No. And if you don't see him, what choice might you make? Go back in. To go back in. And if you got out once safely, you probably won't get out the second time safely. So the goal is to make sure that you know exactly where each other are so that it's not a, a wide space. So um, because we're not at, normally I do this in people's homes so we can look right out their front window and see what works for them. I'm going to have to trust you guys to put down a spot and share it with your spouses, share it with your parents, share it with your boys, so that they know if something should happen, where you're going to be, okay? And the reason that matters is because if people know, your spouses know, but also maybe your neighbor, anybody like that, they're going to be able to tell the fire department or the police, the police officers they're at the mailbox, that's their meeting spot, right? Because they're not going to know who you are either, the fire department and the police. They're not going to know who you are. So we want you guys to have a spot, whether that's the neighbor's mailbox, whether it's a stop sign. Do not make it the fire hydrant. <laughs> Bad choice, okay? Try not to make it that. That doesn't usually go well. But a place that's far enough away that you're not going to be right in the way, but close enough that you don't have to hike a mile and a half to get there because people are going to want to talk to you right so inside here tells you your meeting spots the other thing is practice fire drills because if you practice fire drills it does what we were talking about earlier which is it makes us stop and think right and that's what we need we just need a hesitation we just need a second or two to go you know what there's two doors behind me that don't have fire in front of them I'm going to go through one of those 
But we have to teach ourselves that. We have to teach our children that. We have to teach our grandkids that. Um, hopefully you pass this information along to your sons and they can you know, share it with, with their spouses or their families um, because it's critical. I spend time with my kids going over the different locations. If there's a fire in the living room, how do you get out? I actually call it lava um, because my kids don't like to hear the word fire. <laughs> but lava is imaginary and can't hurt anyone. So um, if the lava is in the basement, how do you get out? If the lava's in the garage, how do you get out, right? So it's all about just making them think and do it differently all the time. And that could be the difference between panicking in that moment or actually making it out safely. So it's really, really, really important to me that you guys just take it, just, just even if it's once a month, even if it takes 10 minutes, just make it fun. Whoever gets out first, you know, whoever, whoever gets out second buys dinner. How's that? Or makes dinner. Um, so, once you've done this, what we like you to do is actually, put, so you write the meeting spot in here, and then put it up on your refrigerator. The reason is when people come to your house, if you have somebody staying, um, visiting, anything like that, it's good for them to know where that is as well. Um, just because you have company doesn't mean you can't have a fire, right? Um, unfortunately, I think sometimes fires are started by company. So, we've covered the meeting spot and how important it is. Now we're going to get to the meat of what you actually came here for, <laughs> which is smoke detectors. So, I told you earlier, I have a 9 and, a, and an 11 year old. Um, I went to school to be a firefighter. I felt like I had a really good handle on smoke detectors, smoke prevention, or fire prevention, safety of my family and my children. And when I first saw this presentation that I'm giving you guys, up to this point, I was like, that's really, really great, helpful information. I really, that's good, right? And then I got this information that I'm about to give you. Um, this is some harder information. It's information that everybody needs to know. It's information that we need to share with people. Um, not that you're going to alter it or change it, but sometimes knowledge is power. And to just know, um, like if I, if I knew I was getting into my car and my car brakes were bad, I would drive my car differently, right? Doesn't mean I would necessarily choose not to drive my car because maybe I need to get somewhere, but I would drive my car differently, okay? That's how these smoke detectors are. So these smoke detectors are called ionization alarms, okay? They're pretty much what everybody has. 90% of all homes have them, okay? We can buy them, Home Depot, Menards, all those kind of places. Um, and the way that these work is that if you have them up on the ceiling and I have a fire over there, what has to happen is the smoke from that fire needs to get up and needs to come all the way over here to make this go off, right? Okay? So I don't know how long that's going to take. But we already talked about the fact that it, a room can be up in three minutes. Now, how long the smoke takes to get here, what that looks like, and how fast that room happens. I mean, even if it takes 30 seconds or 45 seconds, that's a lot of time when you've only got three minutes to get out of a room, right? These um, experts have found as much as 30 minutes between activations of different type of technologies, which basically means that these may not go off for up to 30 minutes after you have a fire. Problem is, we know we got about three minutes to get out. 30 minutes is a little too long. Um, so, has your alarm ever gone off when cooking? I think we said yours has, right? Everybody's, most people, mine did. Um, that's an ionization alarm. And I'm going to explain a little bit more how these work. So they have plates in here. And what happens is ions bounce back and forth between these plates, right? And then something comes in between the plates. And when the ions don't connect, it activates the alarm. What happens with bacon smoke, steam sometimes from showers, toast, things like that, really, really little particles, and there's a ton of them. So they break that connection really, really easily. The synthetic stuff that we have in our homes now, it doesn't do that. It has bigger particles and there's fewer of them. So even though they're going through here, 
they're not completely breaking that circuit, okay? And if you don't completely break it, this thing won't alarm. So, I'm going to show you a little video on how these work. There are different types of detectors available. The most common in homes is the ionization detector. Chances are you are one of the millions of families who go to sleep every night with this type of detector in your hallway. It works like this. Ions flow between two metal plates. When smoke particles enter the chamber, the plug is interrupted and the alarm is triggered. If you burn toast in your kitchen and your smoke alarm goes off, you would probably conclude that it would function adequately in any kind of fire. Well, they begin. Burning toast and kitchen smoke usually produce lots of small particles, just the right combination to block the flow of ions. But the smoke particles produced by, say, a burning sofa could have a larger charge, are fewer in number, and often don't interrupt the flow of ions. The result? Your alarm might not sound, and you and your family may not be protected. Okay, so, did you guys know that? I did. You did? Well, well it's because I told you at the coffee shop. <laughs> it doesn't count. Did you know before I told you? No. Okay. Do you guys have any idea that that's how those worked? Well, and the interesting thing is, you know, like I said, I went to school to be a firefighter. And so firefighters hand these out. Okay. If a police officer gave me information about how to prevent robberies, I would take that information. I would assume that that information was high quality information because it's coming from a police officer. Firefighters hand these out which made me assume that they were the best we could get. And through no fault of the firefighters or anything else, these, these meet code. They do everything that we want them to do, except actually let us know when there's a fire. Um, and firefighters hand them out because the truth of the matter is, is even if it only goes off 20% of the time, that's still 20 more percent of the time than if you didn't have one at all, right? So it's absolutely important to have some sort of fire and smoke protection and prevention in your home. Um, there are different brands. There's, I think, 50 different makers plus, 50 plus different makers of smoke detectors and things of that nature. CO detectors. Do you have CO detectors in your home? Yes. Do you have CO detectors in your home? Okay. Where are they? Like, not what room, just are they, where, where, where are they mounted or located? The carbon dioxide detectors? Carbon monoxide, yeah. Car oh, but yeah, carbon <laughs> dioxide. Okay. Um, we have one on top of the hutch and then one in each of the bedrooms on the dresser. Okay. That's actually good spots for them. Carbon monoxide hangs out right about five, five and a half feet. Okay. So if you have one of the ones that is a smoke detector, carbon monoxide detector, that you plug in down here where all of us have our outlets, it's not gonna work for two reasons. One, where does smoke hang out? Right, smoke hang out up, right? If carbon monoxide's hanging out here and smoke's hanging out there, right? And your alert system's down here, you can see where maybe there's kind of a, you know, a disconnect with that, right? So it's really important to make sure that your carbon monoxide detector is at a height that it will actually detect it as soon as possible. Yes? It's why we go to the ground. Oxygen is a heavy gas. It Correct. falls. Correct. It's absolutely why. Um, so uh, you had mentioned earlier that you were here to hear about smoke detectors and where we put them. Okay. Inside of these uh, boxes where you get the smoke detectors and whatnot, there's little pamphlets. And inside here, it's going to tell you where to put them. Different ones tell you to put them different places. Um, there's one alarm that actually tells you to put it in the back corner from a bedroom. I'm going to tell you that's the absolute wrong place to put a smoke detector. Okay. When smoke comes in a room, if you have your bedroom door closed and smoke comes in a room, it's going to come in in a couple different places, right? It's going to come down there, and it's going to come up here, and it's going to roll out. Okay. It doesn't, smoke doesn't like slither up a wall, it rolls out. Okay, so what they say is about 12 or 18 inches out from your door. On the ceiling? Yes. 
A smoke detector is on the ceiling about 12 to 18 inches out from the door. Um, depending on where it is, if it's a vaulted ceiling, you actually want to bring it down from the vaulted ceiling. You don't want it at the peak of the vault because that is actually dead, dead, dead airspace up there. And so you're not going to get a lot of smoke or rotation up there. Okay. Um, so that's where, if you're mounting them, that's where you should put them. Now, I'm going to share with you some bad news about where to put them. So I'm going to go ahead and apologize up front about this. Um, this piece of paper is the single reason above every other reason why I stand in front of you today. Um, I think I've referenced Reese and Griffin a couple times. They're the reason I do everything. Um, they're the reasons that I make the decisions I make and, and uh, you know, why I get up in the morning. And what might be acceptable for me in my life, like we were talking about the brakes on the car, I might drive the car with bad brakes if I'm the only one in it. I'm not going to drive a car with bad brakes and put Reese and Griffin in it, right? We make different choices. So because of that, when I read this for the first time, um, it became my passion and my duty to share this information with people. Again, not because you can necessarily do something about it, but I think if you know it, it's going to make a difference. So inside the first alert thing, there are, well, there's all kinds of itty bitty tiny writing and actually you have to flip it and invert it and do all kinds of stuff even to be able to read it. Um, and on here, there's different numbers of things. I'm going to go ahead and hand it to you so you can follow along if you'd like. The reason that I'm handing it to you is so that you can actually see that it's written in their stuff, not in ours. Um, whether it's first alert, kitty, any number of ones, they all say the same thing inside, just a little bit different verbiage, okay? So, number one says, according to the Federal Emergency Management Agency of the United States government, your alarm may not go off or give early enough warning in as many as 35% of all fires. So that's one in three. I, I, I don't know a lot about, you know, I'm not super good at math, but I'm gonna tell you, I feel like that's not great. I wouldn't go to a restaurant that, you know, one out of three of my meals was bad. I wouldn't do, I was trying to think, like what would I tolerate at 65% in my life? I wouldn't let my kids get by get 65% at school, right? That's a D. I wouldn't, if, if I was having surgery and the doctor said, hey, little thing about the surgery, I'm super good, two out of three times. Third, one, the third time, not so good. But I can do your surgery next Wednesday. What do you think I'm going to say? I'm not, I'm not going to roll the dice, right? And if a surgeon came to me and said, I'm 90%, and can I operate on Reese? I would say, no, I want the 99% surgeon. I want the best surgeon in the world for my kid, right? So right out of the box, they're at 65%. They only actually decrease after that because of the way that they work. So they get dusty, they get grease on them, they get all that kind of stuff and they actually go off less and less. So um, next is where they tell us not to put them. So I told you where to put them if you're putting them, putting them in there, now I'm going to tell you all the places you shouldn't put them. So they say don't put them in your kitchen, don't put them in your garage, don't put them near furnaces, near water heaters, near space heaters. Don't put them in airstreams passing by kitchens. I don't know if you guys have those little flags that you hold up or if it's like, you know, those little orange things at the airport that let you know whether there's airstreams passing by. I don't know what it is, but I don't know how you determine that. Don't put them in damp areas, in humid areas. Don't put them near bathrooms with showers. Don't put them in cold areas or hot areas. Don't put them in dusty areas or dirty areas. Don't put them near fresh air vents near drafty areas, near dead air spaces. Don't put them in insect infested areas and uh, don't put them near fluorescent lights. So they've now informed us that there's really nowhere that we should put them, right? Um, they follow that up with, your alarm may not sense every kind of fire every time. 
your alarm cannot be expected to sense dangerous fires. Good news is we're all having friendly fires, right? They just want to say hi. Right. Just, hey, roll some marshmallows on me. I'm super friendly. No, that doesn't happen. Um, they may not give early warning of fast growing fires and they may not pick up smoking bed, violent explosions, escaping gas, poor storage of flammable liquids, overloaded electrical circuits, children playing with matches or lighters, or persons who set fire on purpose. And lastly, it says, your alarm does not warrant or imply in any way that your smoke detector will protect your lives or property in the event of a fire. Homeowners should be sure to ensure their lives and property. So save your money and don't buy one. That's well, they're you. yes and no. Like I said, I mean, even if they go off 50% of the time, that's 50% more than if you didn't have one at all, right? Um, what, I, what my suggestion is is that there are um, options out there that come with different things. Um, and it, even if you just, even if it is these that you're going to use, just make sure that you're aware that they're not... 100%. They're not 95% fail proof. The reason that I'm sharing this with you is because I think if, if you know that, you will be more likely to do the things to maybe mitigate a fire. You know, maybe you'll be more likely to unplug things. Maybe you'll be more likely to, um, you know, clean the dryer vent or, or do things like that. Because that's really the important thing. If we can prevent a fire from happening, we're never going to know that we did that. I mean, there's no, there's no little thing that says, ooh, that was going to be a fire, but hey, you unplugged it, so it's not. We're never going to know, right? But it still makes sense to do it. And if we now know that A, this may not go off, or B, if it does go off, it potentially could be 30 minutes or longer into the fire, it just gives us a different sense of where we are in the world. It's like knowing that your brakes aren't working well versus assuming that your bricks are working great. You're going to make different choices and do different things, right? And so that's kind of what I wanted to get across to you guys tonight is that um, we've kind of all been uh, misled isn't the right word because nobody told us any different. We all just assumed, right? And they do tell us right there in the box. Um, like I told you, this actually didn't used to be in the box. They put it in there after there was a fire and two little girls perished in a house fire. Um, and then the makers of these had the choice to change their design and make them better or protect themselves with some piece of paper. Like most companies in America, they chose to protect themselves with a piece of paper, which just means that you guys need to protect yourselves and I need to give you this information so you can protect yourselves. Does that make sense? I know I'm not giving you a bunch of good stuff. Everyone's got that sour face. I should come into these things with candy so that when I'm done, I can just give people candy like here. So do you guys have any questions at all? I have another comment. You bet. Uh, the, something that I learned a few years ago that um, after 10 years, you have to replace the units. They don't work anymore. Right, because they actually decrease in um, proficiency basically from the time you get them out. I go into a ton of houses because um, we sit with people and we go through all this. Um, the other thing is, uh, and I forgot to tell you guys this earlier, keep a fire extinguisher in your bedrooms, okay? Reason is, if you have a fire in the middle of the night, even if that fire starts in your kitchen, you're not gonna be able to run to your kitchen, get your fire extinguisher and put it out, right? Plus, I don't want you trying to put a fire out. We want you to get out of the house. Unless it's like the one that you were able to get on right away. Otherwise, just get out. But in order to get out, get the fire extinguisher, get it in front of you, and it will actually kind of, you can spray it and guide your way out, right? If that extinguisher isn't near you in your bedroom, you're not going to be able to do that. Have them checked every six months. Shake them. They're just chemicals in there. You just need to shake them for about 90 seconds. And fire extinguishers are good for six years, OK? Um, as far as smoke detectors, I've gone into houses where they're yellow. Like, all of them are yellow. Well, they never made yellow ones, they only made white ones. So that, again, feeds into the, I'm never going to have a fire. This is just a detail, right? I don't think I'm going to have a fire. If I thought I was going to have a fire, I'd do a better job of protecting myself and my family. 
but I don't think I'm going to. You know, no more than I think I'm going to have a car accident on the way home because my brakes don't work quite right. So um, you do have to replace them every 10 years. Um, people have this idea that they test their, their smoke detectors. Um, there is actually another uh, video that I could show you. Um, basically, it goes into fires, um, what they look like. Uh, there's a fire marshal and some other people that talk. Um, I'm going to tell you, there was also a woman in there who lost four of her children in a house fire, and it's the 911 call, and I feel like it's, um, it's hard for me to listen to, so I choose not to subject people to it if I don't have to. So, um, But it, it's all about how the alarms didn't work and how she had just had them tested that day. Like here in Oregon, um, I, I, you guys probably know that they come with a fire truck, right? The fire truck works with like pizza pit or something and you order a pizza and the fire truck delivers your pizza and when they're there, they check your smoke alarms, right? Okay, when they check your smoke alarms, what they're doing is they're pushing this button. What is this doing? What is this checking? When they're I push that button. Ions. No, no what, but, yes, but battery. what's it doing? Checking a battery. Mm -hmm. It's not checking if there's smoke, right? It's not checking if there's heat. It's just checking to see if the battery works. Mm -hmm. Okay, same thing as people will say, well, I've got one that's hardwired in. Okay, so it's got electrical power to it. <laughs> It, it still doesn't change the fact of how it actually works, right? And how it works is where the problem lies with these. Um, so there are, you know, a number of different options out there. Uh, it's just a matter of investing in what you think serves you serves you best as an individual. So, um, but yeah, testing these doesn't. And, and in fact, in here it says, don't test it with smoke or heat because it could damage it. Okay, it's like saying don't test your swimming suit with water. You can damage it. <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, so don't assume that just because you push the button and it beeps that it actually will go off. Um, just make sure that you have plans. Make sure that you have a, an escape plan. Make sure that you sleep with your doors closed. Make sure that you keep um, a fire extinguisher in your bedroom. Uh, make sure that you practice fire, you know, escape plans and things like that and let people know where you're supposed to be okay it's really 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 important so you guys have any other questions no there's some things I need to do <laughs> not exactly questions no. just things I need to do um, well uh, we also do home inspections so if you were um, at all interested in having us come and uh, do a home inspection. We look at your smoke detectors. We look at your fire extinguishers. Um, check to make sure that they're set in the right spot. Um, like I told you, I work for a company that we do actually have smoke detectors, fire alarms, all that kind of stuff. Um, if that's something that people are interested in, yeah. Where can the viewers find the home safety checklist? Um, well, you know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and leave a stack of this home safety checklist right here at the library. And uh, if they want one, they can stop by here and pick one up. That is an excellent question. Thank you. You guys have anything else? No? We're all done? We're all done. <laughs>